Support for this program is provided by the men and women of the Louisiana Forestry Association. Through sustainable forestry, LFA members promote the health and productivity of Louisiana's forests for generations to come. The Fred B. and Ruth B. Ziegler Foundation of Jennings is a sponsor of Louisiana the state we're in. The Ziegler Museum is a cultural center for southwest Louisiana, featuring European and American artists and wildlife dioramas. Additional funding for this program is provided by the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting. Hi everyone, I'm Charlie Winham. And I'm Shauna Sanford. Welcome to this edition of Louisiana, the state we're in. LSU football coaching legend Paul Dietzel was laid to rest on Friday. He was 89. Later in our show, we will pay tribute to the man affectionately known as the father of modern LSU football. On the medical front, Louisiana has one of the highest rates of overprescribing antibiotics. Federal and state officials say it results in new strains of bacteria that are resistant to antibiotics. And later in the show, part two of the incredible history of Rosenwald schools in Louisiana and the first meeting of the great-grandchildren of Booker T. Washington and Julius Rosenwald. But first, the headlines of statewide interest. Residents from St. Bernard Parish are demanding answers about how a brain-eating amoeba got into their water supply. In the last two years, there have been two deaths caused by the parasite. A 28-year-old man in 2011 after using a neti pot, and just a few weeks ago, a four-year-old child who died after playing on a slip and slide. The meeting was called by State Senator J.P. Morrell. He invited state, local, and federal health officials to field questions from the residents. As for how the amoeba got into the water supply, no one knows at this time. What concerned the Center for Disease Control, Department of Health and Hospitals, is that in municipal water supplies where you have heavy chlorination and fluoride, other chemicals being pumped in, this is never supposed to happen. I think we need a higher level of government to oversee this. I really do. I think they need to step in and put their foot down and demand some answers and create some solutions. Officials do know that chlorine can kill the amoeba, and so they have increased the chlorine levels to burn the parasite. The state epidemiologist says it is safe to drink the water, but residents must avoid getting it up their nose canal, which allows the parasite to travel directly to the brain. Tuesday, October 1st, is the day to sign up for health insurance through the Affordable Care Act, also known as Obamacare. State Insurance Commissioner Jim Donilon says there is no way that everyone will have enough information to make decisions when the new marketplace is open. The complexity of it is mind-boggling, in my opinion. Our phones are going to ring off the hook. The, the phones in Washington are going to ring off the hook. And frankly, I think that's why the president delayed the penalty on, on small business, because he didn't want that flack uh, next year at the same time that they're going to get all this other pushback as well. And Donilon says his office is available for questions. Call 800-259-5300 or you can go online to ldi.louisiana.gov. Remember, the sign-up period runs from October 1st to March 31st of 2014. The opening of the new core steel plant in Convent has been delayed until the end of the year. Now, earlier this week, one of the three storage domes collapsed at the plant in St. James Parish. Fortunately, no one was hurt and no dangerous materials were released. Officials are still investigating the cause of the failure. Bigger paychecks are on the way for 1,400 state employees. The Division of Administration says the pay increases are based on job performance. They apply to classified and unclassified employees in the Division of Administration and the Governor's Office of Homeland Security. No word yet on whether any other state employees will also get a raise. This month, federal health officials reported that at least 2 million Americans fall ill from antibiotic-resistant bacteria every year and at least 23,000 people die from those infections. The Centers for Disease Control says overuse of antibiotics is leading to antibiotic resistance around the world. Louisiana is one of five states with the highest rates of antibiotics prescribed in the country. We sat down with health professionals to find out where do we go from here. 
The world's first antibiotic or bacteria killer was discovered in 1928 by Scottish researcher Alexander Fleming. His discovery of penicillin revolutionized medicine by curing life-threatening diseases such as meningitis, pneumonia, and endocarditis. Antibiotics are among the most commonly prescribed drugs used in human medicine. Eighty-five years later, antibiotics are making a new headline with the Centers for Disease Control. According to their report, more than two million people in the U.S. get sick every year with antibiotic-resistant infections, leading to 23,000 deaths. According to the study, up to 50 percent of all antibiotics prescribed for people are not needed or are not optimally effective as prescribed, and the overuse is leading to antibiotic-resistant strands of bacteria. The idea when Fleming, Alexander Fleming discovered penicillin that this is a beautiful silver bullet that you can just give people and they miraculously get better, this is absolutely true. Antibiotics have saved many, many lives. The problem is, instead of a magic bullet that is very targeted, it's really a sledgehammer. Dr. Julio Figueroa specializes in infectious diseases at LSU's Health Sciences Center. And that when you're using the sledgehammer, you have to understand that it's going to be all kinds of collateral damage that's going to occur. And that's something that we're beginning to see now. The good thing about antibiotics, they kill bacteria. That's also the bad news. For example, this petri dish of a stool sample after taking antibiotics is almost totally free of bacteria. But the next sample, without antibiotics in the digestive tract, is typical of the bacteria you need in your system to stay healthy. And according to the CDC report, throughout the 50 states, Louisiana has one of the highest antibiotic prescription rates in the country. Dr. Figueroa agrees antibiotics are being overprescribed. Particularly in the outpatient setting, it's respiratory tract infections, and then the second uh, major group is urinary tract infections. Now, urinary tract infections are generally very easily treatable and are important uh, to treat, but for short periods of time. Respiratory tract infections, on the other hand, are frequently viral, and even if they are bacterial, tend not to require antibiotics except for in certain very controlled situations. As when we were in residency, we were told, you know, prescribe antibiotics only when needed. Dr. Ronnie Whitfield is a family physician and hosts LPB's monthly segment, Prescription for Health. Patients many times want antibiotics for viral infections, thinking that they're going to cure the viral infections, and, and they don't. Which won't do a thing. Yeah, well, but the doctors have to take the time to explain that. Uh -huh. And so there are many reasons why we don't have time to always explain. And so in many cases, doctors, doctors will prescribe antibiotics that are less harmful in their opinions, but uh, again, we can create antibiotic drug resistance and you have problems where we have these superbugs that won't respond to anything. And so people with immune problems or serious, serious infections can actually die. The CDC report also states antibiotics are also commonly used in food animals to prevent, control, and treat disease and to promote the growth of food producing animals. The use of antibiotics for promoting growth is not necessary and the practice should be phased out. And then you also got to look at the industrial use of animals, where they're giving the animals antibiotics uh, to allow them to, uh, to, if they're infected, of course, to treat them, but also to make them larger. You know, so when we're overprescribing these antibiotics to animals in the industry, that's not a good thing as well. Dr. Figueroa encourages doctors to practice an antibiotics stewardship with patients, explaining some situations do not call for the drug, and they are trying to prevent the collateral damage of antibiotics. And that's something that we're beginning to see now, and that's where the drug resistance issue comes, where the change in the, in the uh, gut flora comes, all these things. We're beginning to see what the effects of the sledgehammer are. And so when I ask my colleagues when they use an antibiotic to think about what else they're doing as they do that, and that's the message I'd like to leave. Now, researchers with the Centers for Disease Control says antimicrobial resistance is one of our most serious health threats and that infections from resistant bacteria are now too common. And one particularly lethal type of drug resistant bacteria is known as CRE. It has become resistant to nearly all antibiotics. It is still relatively rare, causing 600 deaths a year, but researchers have identified it in healthcare facilities in 44 states.
Well, tonight we are happy to bring you part two of the amazing story of the Rosenwald schools in Louisiana. As we explained last week, these schools were built by two men who could not have been more different, but who both had a passion for education and helping the underserved. Just recently, their great grandchildren met for the very first time and we were there. When I walked up, I, I felt the spirit. Well, I'm so glad to hear that they've discovered the building. And so are the countless former students and teachers who returned to this little wooden schoolhouse to celebrate its restoration. This school and hundreds of others like it were built in the early 1900s. They were responsible for educating thousands and thousands of African American children throughout the rural South. The men responsible for establishing the schools had vastly different backgrounds. Booker T. Washington was an educator and civil rights leader. Julius Rosenwald was part owner of Sears Roebuck and one of the richest men in America. The story of their unique partnership is not widely known, but their great grandchildren Children, Robin Banks and Bob Hess, who recently met for the very first time, are determined to keep it alive. From the day he was born until the day he died, he was groomed, so to speak. I don't know if that word is acceptable anymore, but he was groomed to do his life's work, which was build Tuskegee and for education. The story of Julius Rosenwald and Booker T. Washington was one that we grew up with. and, and uh, the impact of Booker T. Washington's ideas on J.R., as he's known in the family, um, was, I mean, from my youngest days, we've known about that. Kathy Hambrick, founder of the River Road African American Museum in Donaldsonville, discovered the schoolhouse and has spent the last 20 years restoring it. Just the idea that people could get an education before there was electricity in an old building like that with a wood-burning stove, I said, oh my goodness, what a wonderful story um, this building could help us tell. As the story goes, Rosenwald, a well-known philanthropist, often got involved with social issues and was known for helping the African-American community in Chicago. In fact, he was in the process of building the first YMCA for blacks when he met Washington. Still, Washington wanted Rosenwald's help in building schools for poor black children in the South. I know that J.R. was moved by the lack of services, social services and education for black people in Chicago. And I know that he built the Provident Hospital there and this was his sense of right. Before agreeing to help Washington, Rosenwald took a trip to the South to see the situation for himself. One of his stops was in Alabama, where he visited Tuskegee University, the school founded by Washington. Julius Rosenwald was amazed and when he returned from the trip down south, a Chicago reporter interviewed him and said, well, Mr. Uh, Rosenwald, what was it like? And he told him about Booker and Booker School, and he said, I have never, ever seen a better example of excellent black person, black man or white. That trip sealed the deal. Rosenwald became a big believer in Washington's vision. Theirs was an incredible relationship, considering the tension between blacks and whites at the time. He was not very popular, and he didn't have a whole lot of other support, but he did it. Look, this is a man who, when the depths of the Depression came, was willing to buy back the shares of anybody's stock in Sears Roebuck at par, and the employees. He was willing to buy back and make them whole. Yeah, wow. There's a, there's a lot of wow in the story of Julius Rosenwald. And the schools in the South is certainly, you know, shines brightly in, among all the jewels in the crown. The men agreed there was one key ingredient that had to be in place in order for their plan to work. Community must come together and do. We too often rely on our elected officials or this person or that person, but it must be a joint effort. The township put up a third, which was the land, the black community put up a third, which was the sweat equity of the building, and the Rosenwald Fund put up a third, which was the building done through Sears Roebuck. 
The blueprints were drawn by the architecture students at Tuskegee. Each floor plan was named according to the number of teachers, and the number of teachers dictated how many windows each school would have. For example, if there were four teachers, there would be four windows on each side of the building. To me, the significance of Booker is he built models. He built models that uh, for personal achievement, economic progress, for character building, and all of those things are necessary today. Although the partnership between Rosenwald and Washington didn't last for long, it has had a long-lasting impact. They met in, I think, 1911. Booker died in 1915. That was a four-year relationship that produced 5,338 plus schools. Both of them um, had philosophies saying that man's greatest uh, purpose on earth is to uplift others. The Jewish community had that same philosophy that if you have, you give. If you don't have, you still give. And Booker was about that too. He gave his whole life for education. Because education is the key to anybody's future. And I can't tell you how many people come up to me when they find out that I'm associated with the family somehow. I was a Rosenwald School graduate. My parents were my family. Or I, you know, this did something in a community where we had nothing. It's very moving. It's tremendously moving. And to be able to absorb the vision, to be able to have one man absorb the other man's vision, that's, you know, that's quite something. Makes you proud? Oh, absolutely. Every day. These people had real impact and impacted people's lives, and that's it's very moving. I get goosebumps. <laughs>is the kind of story that gives you goosebumps. It's oh a great one. Oh my goodness, yeah. two incredible men that their their efforts still have ripple effects over a hundred years ago. Yeah, yeah. Neat and the, story. And the schoolhouses are still being preserved in many southern states, Charlie, and some are still being used as schools, others as community centers. The National Trust for Historic Preservation has named the schools among the most endangered places and has created a campaign to raise awareness and money to restore them. In fact, Kathy Hambrick of the River Road African American Museum believes that there could very well be more Rosenwald schools throughout Louisiana. To find out more, visit AfricanAmericanMuseum.org. Paul Dietzel is known as the father of the modern era of LSU football. This week, the legendary coach died at the age of 89 after a brief illness. Dietzel led the LSU Tigers to its first national title in 1958. And the ripple effects of Coach Dietzel can still be seen today as LSU football continues to be one of the most successful programs in the country. But there's so much more to this dedicated and humble man. LPB President Beth Courtney has followed his career over the years, and tonight we pay tribute to Coach Dietzel, who was also named an LPB Louisiana legend in 2005. Yeah was really a wonderful man and, and really knew what he was doing. He always was very much on the details and everything was so organized and so planned. So he, he knew how to prepare his football team to meet the challenge. In the world of Louisiana football, Paul Dietzel is an icon, head coach of Louisiana State University's first national championship team. Paul managed to energize the state's sports fans and elevate the school's program to legendary status. When you put on that yellow helmet, it meant something to you. When you put on the blazer that had LSU across the pocket, you, you, you knew that you were part of a tradition of something very, very good. Uh, he taught us to be very, very proud, not cocky, but very, very proud. A lieutenant in the Army Air Corps, Paul flew a dozen missions against Japan while only in his 20s. At Miami University in Ohio, he earned All-State and All-American honors as a center. At the age of 30, after coaching beside greats like Bear Bryant and Vince Lombardi, he took over LSU's fledgling football program in 1955. 
Coach Dietzel managed only 11 wins during this first three years, but that would change by 1958, as he began to wear down opponents with a revolutionary three-team system. So we took our 11 best players, offense and defense, and they became the white team, because they always wore white jerseys. And then the, what was left over, we took the best 11 offensive players, and they became the gold, go team. Well, I call them a gold team first, but then they got shortened to go team. And naturally, the, what was left over, we took the best of what is left over, and they became the Chinese men. At a point in time when you were playing offense and defense, this man came up with the brilliance of first, second, third, white, go, and bandits, and the Chinese bandits stole the heart, in my opinion, of the sports world in college football. Everybody in the world wanted to be a Chinese bandit. With an 11-0 season, the Tigers were the 1958 undisputed national football champions and Sugar Bowl victors. Paul won the National Coach of the Year Award by the widest margin ever recorded and was the youngest person ever to receive it. It was about as wonderful as you, it gets. I mean, uh, I think the thing that uh, was so wonderful about it was that it taught me that Napoleon was right when he said uh, it is morale over material three to one. And uh, he was right. The reunions of your 58 team, yeah. and you all are all pretty close still, aren't you? Yes, I will say that uh, you never, I've told the players this many times, and it's really true, uh, you don't know it, but these fellas that you're in this room with, this or this sh in this huddle with, they're going to be the best friends for the rest of your life. Now, you might not think that's true, but it's true. Because you have something that you have done together by the hardest. And uh, it's just, uh, it's going to stick with you for the rest of your life. These are going to be the your best friends you'll ever have, and it's true. He put LSU on the map. That's what drove LSU to prominence for 20 or 30 years since then. Nicknamed Pepsi and Paul for his winning smile, Paul led LSU to two SEC titles, two Sugar Bowl trips, and an Orange Bowl appearance. Although he left in 1962 for a coaching job at West Point, he returned 16 years later as LSU's athletic director. We're planning for a great season at LSU. It ought to be a lot of fun. I think it's going to be great. The biggest crowd ever to see a football game in Tiger Stadium. I know I'm a, an official member of the LSU family because in the last week I've gotten four campus tickets and yesterday my car was impounded. <laughs> I coached for 27 years and I was a head coach for 20 years and when 20 years was up, my goal was to be a football coach in a major institution, head coach, for 20 years. When I got to 20 years, I had put in my time and basically, I really have never looked back. Paul's career has allowed him to associate with presidents and personalities but any success he attributes to his faith and a devoted, loving family. Today, as an accomplished watercolor artist, Paul Dietzel maintains the focused intensity that makes him a Louisiana legend. LSU's current head football coach, Les Miles, said about Coach Dietzel, he loved this school, and he loved his association with our team. He will be missed. He was a special man, and Tiger Nation will miss him. I will miss him. LSU Athletic Director Joe Oliva said Coach Dietzel was a man of great honor and integrity. Looking back at what he accomplished here at LSU, he was way ahead of his time as a football coach. And former LSU basketball coach Dale Brown added, Paul Dietzel is one of the nicest human beings I have ever met. It reminds me so much of John Wooden. Both of these coaching giants left a much larger imprint on society than their marvelous coaching accomplishments. Well, that is our show for this week. If you would like more information on this program or some of your other favorites, visit our website at lpb.org. And don't forget to like us on Facebook. You're going to enjoy it. And we have almost 6,800 fans so far. Wonderful. So please join us. For everyone here at Louisiana Public Broadcasting, thanks for watching. Until next time, that's the state we're in. We'd like to hear from you. 
Right Louisiana, the state we're in, 7733 Perkins Road in Baton Rouge. Call toll-free 1-800-272-8161 or email LPB. And visit our website at lpb.org to view your favorite stories again. This and other editions are available on home video. Support for this program is provided by the men and women of the Louisiana Forestry Association. Through sustainable forestry, LFA members promote the health and productivity of Louisiana's forests for generations to come. The Fred B. and Ruth B. Ziegler Foundation of Jennings is a sponsor of Louisiana the state we're in. The Ziegler Museum is a cultural center for Southwest Louisiana, featuring European and American artists and wildlife dioramas. Additional funding for this program is provided by the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting.